Welcome to Streaming Sciences. I'm Marissa Crowhurst, an undergraduate student at the University of Florida studying agricultural and natural resources communication. I'm originally from Deltona, Florida and came to UF in Streaming Science for my love of agriculture and passion for science communication. We're coming to you live with our electronic field trip about hydroponics from the UF IFAS North Florida Research and Education Center, Suwannee Valley in Live Oak, Florida. Streaming Science is a student-driven science communication platform at the University of Florida in the Department of Agricultural Education and Communication. We will take questions throughout today's EFT, so make sure you're adding questions into the chat box. We would love to hear where you're from and we'll give you a special shout out. Let us know where you're watching and let me introduce you today to our experts. Today we have with us Jay Capasso and Kelly Awe. Would you like to introduce yourselves and tell you a little bit about each other? Okay. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Jay Capasso. I'm the row crop extension agent in Columbia County, which is central North Florida in the Lake City area. And I work with farmers trying to get the research that happens at the University of Florida out to my local community. And I work primarily with peanut farmers, field corn farmers, and watermelon farmers. I also get 10% uh, of my job is focused on 4-H youth development. So I also get to go into local schools and talk about agriculture and do agricultural education. So I'm really excited to be here today with Streaming Science. And my name is Kelly Awe. I'm the Swanee River Partnership Outreach Coordinator, and I'm based here at North Florida Research and Education Center, Swanee Valley. I work with stakeholders throughout the Swanee River Basin, and we use um, science-based solutions to help improve our water quality and quantity here in the Swanee River Basin. Thank you guys for introducing yourself and telling us a little bit. Jay, can you tell us a little bit about Extension and what you do? Yeah, so I work primarily with the row crop farmers in my county. However, there are other extension agents in my office. We have an agent that focuses on livestock production. So if farmers have issues uh, raising cattle or related to livestock production, or she also focuses on natural resources, they would go to her. We also have a horticulture agent that works with master uh, gardener volunteers and with homeowner issues related to horticulture. We have a family and consumer sciences agent that helps people out with their taxes and works with um, you know, issues related to family and consumer sciences. We also have a 4-H agent. So Extension does a lot of different things and each county is different. We have different agents focusing on different areas, but a primary point of Extension is to get the research that occurs at land grant universities like the University of Florida out to the community. And that's where uh, us extension agents come in with our respective uh, program areas. Thank you, Jay. Kelly, would you like to tell us a little bit about NFREC and some of the things you guys do here? Yeah, so we do a lot of things here at NFREC Swanee Valley. We do a lot with row crops. We're on 400 acres, and so a lot of our work is on row crops, and those are like corn and um, peanuts. We also do stuff with carrots. We work in the greenhouse. You'll see videos of our smart garden and our hydroponic tomatoes in our greenhouse. We also do other things like with what's behind us. We, this is turmeric that's behind us, and it's a media research project because we have very sandy soils in this area, and it's hard to wash off the soil off of our roots. And so we're trying to figure out if there's a better way a better type of soil to grow it in and so there's a lot of different things that kind of cover the whole board here at, Swan at in Swanee Valley. Thank you so much Kelly. Our theme for today's program is from the ground up and our topic today is all thing hydroponics. As we learned in our last EFT, soil is the building block of most of our food, agricultural, and environmental systems. But with hydroponics we can actually grow plants without soil. We can use a variety of materials to grow plants in a sustainable environment. Jay, will you tell us a little bit about that? What is hydroponics? Yeah, so hydroponics is a subset of horticulture that generally involves growing plants such as vegetables in a water media. 
So generally in agriculture, we're using a soil media, but in this case, we're actually using water that's been conditioned. Uh, we've controlled for the pH of the water and we've added nutrients to the water to be able to grow plants in it. And for agricultural purposes, this is generally done in a greenhouse and it generally involves uh, vegetable production. So it's a really exciting field. Uh, it's often used in urban agriculture and there's also aquaponics that occurs that's a subset with hydroponics where they use fish waste to be able to grow plants so it's a very exciting field thank you so much jay a term we often hear about it when we come to our food system is sustainability we know that there are concerns about having enough food to feed everyone on our planet in ways that protect our environment kelly what can you tell us about sustainability and how research centers just like this one work on sustainable agricultural solutions yeah, so almost everything we do here has to do with sustainable agriculture because we're trying to figure out the best management practices to use on each of the crops in order to make it more sustainable. Also, we have to be able to, farmers still be able to make money while still feeding the world. And so we do a lot of nutrient management work here. We also do some water quantity, like how much water you actually apply onto the crops. And so there's a lot that goes into sustainable agriculture and we have a strong focus on that here. Thank you, Kelly. And some would say that hydroponics are an urban farming solution, correct? A way for us to grow food in places where farms and large gardens may not be possible. Before we get into the thick of our hydroponics content, do we have any questions coming in from our viewers about the center, Jay and Kelly, NFREC, or sustainable agriculture? Hi guys, so our first question is from Kayla and she wants to know how can someone become an extension agent? So I guess I'll answer that one since I am an extension agent. So I started my career in extension after receiving my master's in soil and water sciences from the University of Florida. And it's been a really rewarding career getting to work with farmers, getting to answer their questions and getting to work with the specialists and the researchers at the University of Florida who I often go to to help answer those questions. And there are a lot of different fields that extension agents work in. Uh, generally, you need a, at least a bachelor's degree in your given field uh, to be able to be hired as an extension agent. Then as you work as, as an extension agent, they require you to get your master's, I believe, within six years. So it can be a great way to get a master's degree uh, through University of Florida's employee education program as well. And it's a great field if you like working with farmers, you like working outside, and you get and you like uh, getting to help people. It's a very rewarding career. Our next question is: Are fish a good way to add nutrients to the water? They are. So fish create waste. You feed the fish. Um, there are a lot of different aquaponic systems. Some use crayfish. Some use koi. Some use tilapia. I've seen, I think, jade perch and some other types of fish used. And, you know, certain fish like different water temperatures. So you need to figure out what the water temperature is that you want to grow your vegetables in or your crop in. And then make sure that aligns with uh, the fish that you want to grow as well. For example, trout is a cold water fish that sometimes is used for aquaponics, but they like colder water. So some of the vegetables you might want to produce uh, aren't good for trout aquaculture. So yeah, it's a, definitely a way to grow, uh, grow plants and grow fish at the same time, reusing some of the nutrients from the fish waste. Our last question is, can you do hydroponics from home? You can, and today I'll be uh, doing a demonstration to show you how to do aquaponics in the classroom or at home. It can be a very complicated system in the greenhouse that you know costs a lot of money to maintain, but in this system that I'm gonna show you today is literally in a five gallon bucket, and any of you could do it after uh, going by your local garden store. So I'm excited to show you that demonstration. That sounds neat, Jay, thank you very much. One really cool, cutting edge possible sustainable solution that you're testing out here at NFREC is the freight farm and it's operated and managed by agricultural and hydroponics expert Wanda Laughlin. Kelly, what can you tell us about Wanda and her role here? 
Yeah, so Wanda is an amazing resource for hydroponics or greenhouses in general. She's our protected ag manager, which means anything that's in a structure or like the freight firm it's inside, you know, a little container that she is in charge of those projects. And she was unable to be with us here today, which is why she recorded some um, videos because she was teaching a hydroponic tomato class today. Thank you so much, Kelly. Now we have a video for you. Wanda is going to take us on a tour of the Research Center's freight farm. I'm really excited to see what's inside. Let's check it out. Hi, my name is Wanda Laughlin. I'm an Ag Assistant too, and the manager of the Greenhouse Protected Ag Program here at the North Florida Research and Education Center in the Suwannee Valley. Today we're standing in front of our newest endeavor here at the, the Research Center, and this is what we call the Smart Garden. Um, it is a freight farm, so it is in controlled environment agriculture. So inside this unit, uh, in this project, there are 15 of these units across the country. This is the southernmost um, located unit, and we've been running this since January. It was delivered in December. We started sowing seeds and running the unit in January, and we did our first harvest in March. All of the produce that is produced inside the unit is going to a, lo a local food bank, um, and for our community support, we are working with the Ag Engineering Department on campus as, long, as well as our extension in Suwannee County with our Master Gardeners for use as volunteers. So it is volunteer driven um, and community based. Right now we have kale growing, so it's one crop, everybody is growing the same crop, so it's all kale. So if y'all are ready, we can go inside and see what the unit looks like on the inside. So now that we're inside the Smart Garden, I'd like to show you around and show you some of the technology and some of the growing areas that are inside the garden. Okay, so we're gonna start off in our growing area. This is our nursery area. So this is where we start off. So we have two growing stages. So we start off on the bottom, and then as the plants mature, we move them to the top, and then we adjust the lights accordingly. And then once they're ready to plant, these panels that you see behind me come down and then we finish, we plant them out and we finish growing them in what we call our cultivation area. The unit pumps water up through the tops of these channels and then there's pressure, cap pressure compensating emitters that irrigate every channel individually. So this is a water efficient unit. So we use about five gallons of water a day and they are top irrigated. So at the top of every one of these panels is an irrigation pipe that comes through. There's two of them, one for the left side of the panel, one for the right, and every individual channel has its own drip emitter at the top. So it's just a slow drip that is gravity fed. So once it drips, it hits a wick that is inside. It is compressed between two pieces of foam, and then the actual plug is sandwiched between those two pieces of foam up against that wick. That wick is the only thing that holds moisture in this system. We, you see a combination of blue and red lights behind us. That is, blue and red are the main drivers of photosynthesis. So those are, these are LED low emitting diode lights. So there's not a lot of heat that comes off of these. There are some heat. They have different effects on the plant, the blue and the red. So we have a ratio, about an 80 to 40 ratio of red to blue lights. Um, red causes more stem elongation. Um, the blue tends to have more of a, a widening plant canopy. Uh, when I'm in here working, the plants are actually asleep, and I'll use a green headlight so I don't wake the plants up. Um, so it's a, it's a very sensitive growing system. So when I mentioned that plants go to sleep, we don't think about plants sleeping. So at, there's different triggers for daylight length for plants. They, some plants need optimum amount of daylight hours in order to produce a fruit or a flower. In the case of leafy, leafy greens, they're not as sensitive to daylight, there are some crops that are daylight neutral. So what happens, once the, the hours change um, throughout the season, the plants can identify this. And when they go to sleep, they actually, they have pores in their leaves like you have pores in your skin. So when the plants are ready to shut down for the evening, they close those, what they're called stomata, they close those so they're not transmit, they're not transpiring. Transpiring in a plant is them sweating essentially. So as they take water in, they use it, 
they have all these chemical reactions that happen, they have to transpire that back out. So gases and moisture from the plant escape. So when they're ready to go to sleep, just like you are, they, they start shutting down for the night and that's when they start to regenerate. Um, and in the morning, there, as the daylight starts to the, we come into daylight hours, those stomachs are opening again, um, and they start physically taking up water and gases, and they start doing their exchange. And because we have cameras in here, I can flip through the time lapse on the cameras, and you can actually see the leaves move around as the plants. So we think it's all quiet until the, the cameras come on, then you start, start seeing the plants move, and they're, they, it looks like they're doing the wave if you go through the these through the cameras it's really it's fun the mission of these and the, the intent of these controlled environment agricultural units is to bring produce into high populated city centers or food deserts places where fresh produce is not available to people um, places where water is not available as well um, you were going to have to have power but uh, trying to get community agriculture and getting fresh produce into these places is, is very important and it's vital. These are clean, water efficient units. There's not a lot of chemical input, so there's not a lot of handling. There's less foodborne illness. We don't have um, animal intrusion. We don't have to apply insecticides. Um, this is not an organic unit, but there are systems and units that can be organic, so you could go that way. Um, we use synthetic fertilizer, so we don't fall into that. But they can be modified. This was a shipping container. There are old buildings, there are old greenhouses that have been augmented to use artificial light um, that can go into controlled environment agriculture. It is still evolving technology, so there's a lot to learn, and that's what we are doing at the University of Florida and through this project, through EPRI and Seminole Electric, is we're trying to see if this is viable for the future of growing agriculture. That was a pretty neat video, right guys? If you have any questions, don't forget to put them in the chat. Speaking of questions, Jay, can you tell us a little about, about what kind of vegetables are grown here in Florida? Well, that's almost a tough question because we grow so many vegetables here in Florida. We have a very warm climate down here in Florida compared to the rest of the lower 48 United States. So in South Florida, we do a lot of winter vegetables. Uh, down there around Belle Glade and Everglades agricultural area, there's a lot of lettuce that is produced and a lot of other winter vegetables. We have a lot of tomato production here in Florida. Florida is also one of the top producers of watermelon in the United States as well. So Florida has a lot of vegetable production and we have some grown under hydroponics as well. That's pretty neat. Thank you, Jay. Kelly, can you tell us a little bit about what we grow here at the greenhouses? Yeah, so we grow a lot of different things here in our greenhouses. It kind of depends on exactly what grant we have coming in to fund that because we sometimes have some projects where we're, we have like an emerging crop or we think that the direction of hydroponics or greenhouses are going one way and so we'll try to help farmers out by doing research. One of the things we have is we have a lettuce breeding program that we have a grant through there so we grow a lot of lettuce. We also have um, tomatoes in our greenhouse which you'll see a video about later and we sometimes do edible flowers, cut flowers, peppers. There's just so many different things that we do grow. And then like our turmeric is in our greenhouse as well. Thank you so much, Kelly. Speaking of tomatoes in the greenhouse, we have another video from Wanda highlighting that. Let's go ahead and watch that. So we are now in our teaching greenhouse that we grow our mining crops in. We have a crop of greenhouse tomatoes right here. These are indeterminate tomatoes, meaning that they don't get vegetative and stop growing and then produce fruit. These guys keep going until with a central leader until we decide to turn them off. So greenhouse tomatoes are about a nine month crop. We plant in September. We finish the crop in June. Part of what we do here is trying to get small farmers to have income 12 months out of the year. So greenhouse vining crops being usually a nine month crop um, during the summer months, that's time for growers to break down and clean up and get ready to start again. And they can diversify and that's what we teach people is they can use different structures, different crops to, to diversify and so they get more than nine month income ahead of the year.
So we utilize these houses to do hands-on trainings and teaching because most people don't have access to this type of a crop and don't understand how to work it. So we initiate physiological disorders in the plant to try and show people how to remedy those. Um, and we also test varieties for people um, in different companies and we try to um, evaluate pests and diseases overall and that's how we help our growers. Now that we've explored both the freight house and the freight farm and the greenhouse, let's take a break and answer some questions from the viewers. Our first question is, are there other color lights that help with plant growth? Do you want why don't you, you go, <laughs> we just discussed this. <laughs> <laughs> so generally with plant growth, red and blue light is what plants are taking up. And when it comes to yellow and green light, they don't take up as much as uh, that those wavelengths. So when we're talking about plant growth and light, it's usually in the blue and the red uh, wavelengths of the light spectrum. What's your favorite thing about hydroponics? I think my favorite thing about hydroponics is I just love the, well, it's aquaponics, I guess I'm kind of cheating, but I love the idea of growing plants and fish together. I've always liked uh, having fish, so that's one of my favorite things about it. What other plants can you grow in a freight farm? So I think often lettuce is produced in these freight farm sy systems. Yeah. One thing that Wanda has talked about a lot is that she thinks that high-end herbs would be a really great thing to grow into these systems. Like if you're in a very urban area where you can't get herbs as often, then um, or fresh herbs as often, that would be that's a good environment for it. But there's a lot. Yeah, leafy greens is pretty perfect for that freight farm. Our next question is: What are the best plants to grow in a greenhouse? I mean, you can kind of grow almost anything in a greenhouse. I really love growing tomatoes in greenhouses. It, I just think it's fun mainly because, you know, they go, you can watch them like ripen. I just always think that's really fun with tomatoes. But you can grow a lot of things in greenhouses. Do you, can you think of anything specific you can't? Well, I mean, I, I guess maybe trees, you know, you're probably going to be uh, limited by the height of your greenhouse. Otherwise, there's a lot of different things you can grow in a, in a greenhouse uh, environment. But I have seen greenhouses that were used to grow, um, grow trees or taller crops that are just very tall. So those do exist. Kayla would like to know how many freight farms are in Florida? So I do not know the answer to that one, do you? So for this project specifically that we have here, we're the only one here in the state of Florida. We're actually the furthest south um, unit, but there are similar things like the freight farm. I don't know of anyone that's actually, they have a freight farm, but there are some people that they've taken old warehouses that they've converted and it looks very similar to what the freight farm is. And so there's some of that happening a little bit in Florida, but otherwise for this specific project, we're the only one in the state of Florida. Our last question is, where does the food go that is grown at the NFREC? It depends. <laughs> so that's kind of a tough question because we, um, unfortunately for food safety reasons, there are some things that we're not allowed to uh, sell or we're not allowed to be able to give out to the public. But for our freight farms specifically, all that kale is going to an organization that is giving it to people that are unable to afford food. Um, then we also have, we when we grow our carrots, they go to a deer farm because the deer love our carrots and so that's where that goes. And then we do not want to compete with the farmers in this area at all. And so whenever we sell our corn, like our grain corn, we try to wait until the end of season so we're not competing with farmers in this area and then the best part about working here is that the like all my co-workers and myself we get some of the food and so like the tomatoes we're growing in the hydroponic um, or in the hydroponic um, tomatoes in the greenhouse right now I've already I've been taking a whole bag home every week it's been great 
Well, thank you, Jay and Kelly, for answering some of those questions for us. As we mentioned at the beginning of the program, UF IFAS Extension has an office with extension experts like Jay in every county throughout the state, supporting local communities on a variety of agricultural and natural resource topics. We want to introduce to you another extension expert working with hydroponics in the Orange County area, which is like the Orlando area. Her name is Hannah Wooten. She recorded this quick video introdu introduction for us. Okay, now Jay is going to show us the technique that Hannah will often teach growers in the Orlando area about. It's called Set It and Forget It Hydroponics. Jay, would you like to show us what that's about? Yeah. So, let's see, we got some lettuce seed here, and I'm going to teach you how to grow lettuce using a hydroponic method and using a simple method that can be done in a bucket. So, um, it can be done in the classroom, it can be done at home. And I'm going to start out using these grow pots or these grow cubes. And basically what these do is they soak up water. And we can place about one lettuce seed in each one. And I already have a few in there that you might be able to see. But we can place one lettuce seed to two lettuce seeds depending how um, old the seed is. And we'll place that in each of these. And I already have a few in there. And what seeds need to grow is they need water, they need moisture, they need to be at the right temperature for the, the specific plant, and they need air. They need airflow. And uh, seeds, as they grow up, will need a certain amount of light uh, as they become a seedling to be able to grow properly. So we have our grow cubes here, which absorb water. And we want to add some moisture to the Tupperware here and we're gonna fill it up and we want to fill it up so that it's high enough that the plants seed will absorb water but not too high so that it would cover the plant seed and provide an issue with the the seed uh, getting air airflow and oxygen and whatnot so now that we've done that we can cover up the Tupperware and we can leave the grow cubes in there for about two to three weeks. Covering it up provides, you know, you're trapping the moisture in there. And two or three weeks later, we can come back and we can see that our seeds will become seedlings. And lettuce is a dicot type kind of vegetable. Most of our uh, vegetables are dicots. And that means it'll come out with two leaves. A root will emerge from the seed and then two leaves will emerge from the seed and that will take about two to three weeks and then we can place it here in our bucket we have a five gallon bucket here now let me show you the the water media that we have so you can see that we filled it basically all the way to the top and we took the lid of the bucket and we drilled two inch diameter holes in it using our drill over here that you can see And we deviated from Hannah's uh, method just a little bit. I put four in. She recommended just putting three in. But what we'll be able to do is once these seedlings emerge, 
we can add our plants to the bucket. But there's a few steps that we have to do first before we do that. We need to check the pH of the water that we add to our bucket. And we wanna be in about a pH of five to a pH of six. pH has to do with the potential of hydrogen. The pH of our water uh, moves from zero to 14. So anything under seven is a more acidic pH. Anything above seven is an alkaline pH. And the, what we probably have here as just straight tap water is a neutral pH, which is a pH of seven. And some of you maybe have done this before, testing the pH of your fish tank at home or testing the pH of uh, your soil at home. It's an important concept when we uh, talk about nutrients. And let me see if I can find the, the pH strip here. So I get this right this time. So you can see that we have a pH of about seven. See that it matches up there. So we need to acidify the pH so it gets down to about 5.5 or so. So the way we will do that is adding some distilled vinegar to the water solution. And what we'll need is about, I believe, 10 teaspoons of this distilled vinegar. Let's see if I can grab. And I'm not gonna take the time to add all all 10 in, but I will add a little bit to show you. And this is something, distilled vinegar is very cheap, something you get at the grocery store. And let me just put a couple more in and we'll see if there's any difference in the pH this time. All right, one more. take out another pH strip yep, I grab two let's see if we see any difference It looks like we have a more acidic pH now. We're about, I'd say we're about a five. Five to six. So that's pretty cool that it made a difference with just a little bit of um, distilled vinegar. But normally we wanna add a little bit more um, distilled vinegar um, and that will help us be able to grow our crops. The other thing we'll wanna add to our, our water solution is some fertilizer. And it all depends on the type of product we have. I believe the back of this label says to add about a half teaspoon of miracle Grow for every single gallon of water that we have. So we have five gallons of water in here. So I'm gonna add. Add about five of these really quick. One, two, three, four, five. And another thing that can be added is just a little bit of Epsom salt. This helps provide uh, magnesium and other nutrients as well. So I believe this is also about a half teaspoon per gallon type kind of rate up to uh, one teaspoon per gallon. So once we have done that, we can take our plants. We just have uh, basil and some parsley to put in here. And we want the, the water to kind of cover up the plant basket about halfway. And Hannah calls this method set it and forget it. So we can just kind of leave this here and watch the plant grow. And I think there are a few important concepts to think about with this. Uh, one is that the, the nutrients that we provide our plants, we often think of it as plant food, but it's not really plant food because plants get their nutrients 
from fertilizers, but they get their food or energy from the sun. So they're a little bit different than us. We get our nutrients from food and our energy from food. So plants are a little bit different. They get their nutrients from the water solution in this case, or in terrestrial environments, the soil, and they get their energy from the sun. That was pretty neat, Jay. Thank you so much for that demonstration. We will make sure that you get emailed the link to Hanno's blog so that you can find the materials and steps to build your own hydroponic system if you're interested in giving it a try. So now we have time for one last round of questions and we'll hand it over to Miss Annabelle. What advice would you give to students who are interested in this type of work? So I would say to pursue, you know, whatever you're interested in, especially when you get to college. For me, I, you know, I struggled with science type kind of courses when I was in high school because it wasn't put in, put in a perspective that I was interested in. I didn't have a, I don't think I had an agriculture type kind of course in my high school growing up. So when I got to college, I was able to kind of study science courses that were more focused on my kind of interest area. So, you know, once you get to college or, you know, whatever you decide to do someday, you may be able to put your interest um, into things uh, more specific. What is something you wish everyone knew about hydroponics? Hmm. Well, I guess that plants can grow out of water. I mean, it's pretty interesting how we can condition water to be able to grow plants so well and that we can use fish and aquaponics to be able to grow fish and uh, plants at the same time. So that's a, a re really interesting um, component about hydroponics. Do you need to control the water temperature in the bucket for the plants to grow? You do, and it depends um, if you have the optimal temperatures outside to be able to grow the plants. For lettuce, for example, if we were growing lettuce, they like the cooler temperature, uh, that plant. And I believe you said earlier it was around 70, 60, 60 to 70. 70 degrees. And I know that I had some farmers in Columbia County within the last month or so who planted some lettuce outside after growing it out in the greenhouse first. So it depends on the plant that you're growing. And, but certain plants need certain temperatures, so you can either control for that in a greenhouse or indoor setting, or you can wait for the right time of year. And luckily here in Florida, we have uh, the winter and we have different areas in Florida where we have different temperatures throughout the year. So we can grow a lot of different crops. Where did you purchase all of the materials for this project? So I was lucky because uh, Wanda gave me all these materials to be able to present to you today. But you can purchase a lot of these materials at your local garden store. If you look up hydroponic store, you may find that there's a hydroponic store um, in your town or nearby. So, you know, the, a lot of these are household uh, or things you can buy at a hardware store as well. So you, you may be able to find all of this uh, nearby. And I recommend looking at Hannah Wooten's blog. You can just Google Hannah Wooten and set it and forget it. And that blog will come up. What happens to the plants if the pH is wrong and do different plants need a different pH? Different plants do need a different pH. So most plants, if we're talking about soil, like a pH around 6.5. However, there are certain plants like azaleas or blueberries that like pHs that are much lower, maybe around five or so, or even lower than that. So there are some plants that really like acidic soils. For these plants, you may just not have as good of nutrient conditions. They, the nutrients might be there in the water, but if you have it at the wrong pH, the plant may not uptake the nutrients as well. So you could see uh, issues where there are nutrient deficiency symptoms in the plant uh, when the pH is out of whack and it's not in the, the right level. How long does it take for lettuce to grow? So the way I'm familiar with lettuce agriculture is that it's generally uh, grown out in the greenhouse for a few weeks and then it's transplanted, meaning it's taken from the greenhouse and set into the field. Or in this case, it's set into um, the, the bucket that we created. And generally, I believe it takes about three weeks after we transplant uh, to, for the lettuce to kind of grow out to a, to a full height that we'd want to harvest it at and put it on the, our plate and put some dressing on it. 
Our last question is from Kayla. She wants to know, do you have to keep putting more fertilizer in the water? So I think in this system, we're probably okay with fertilizer, but there may be situations if we have to add more water, if there's a lot of evaporation over time, we may need to want to add a tiny bit more fertilizer as well. But my guess is that in this this system, it's relatively simple enough that you're able to kind of just use the, the same bucket over time. Yeah, I know when we've done these in the past that you also have to watch for rain because depending on the acidity of the rain, then you may have to make some tweaks as well to your fertilizer. The other thing is, is that the salt has to be added because um, the salt evaporates out here. That's the reason why it's so good to have some Epsom salt to go in there. So it's just, you can start to tell if a plant is not happy because it'll start showing it on its leaves and you can kind of start getting an idea of maybe it needs something more in the water. And, but usually... Jay's right, you can you can really just set it and leave it. You don't have to really baby it a whole lot. Well, thank you guys so much for answering those questions. And we want to thank Jay and Kelly for all their advice today and all their expertise. Um, thank you guys for tuning in to our EFT. Um, if you want to follow more student-driven science communication projects, please follow us at streamingsciences.com. I want to take a quick minute to introduce our team who's been behind the Streaming Science crew this entire time. Over here we have Lexi who has been our awesome director. She has been in charge of flipping between the different screens. And then we have Annabelle and Caroline who have been fielding the questions for us. And then behind the cameras we have Maddie and Mackenzie doing the best job they can by running around and catching us all on screen. Thank you guys so much for tuning in once again and we'll see you next spring for our